Hi, I'm Angela Cavanaugh, the Executive Director of the New Jersey Chapter of CAI. I would like to welcome all attendees and thank our partners, the Board of Directors, our Legislative Action Committee, and the CAI team for today's program. Some housekeeping rules today. All participants will be muted. Please type your questions into the question box. Managers, if you need a certificate of completion, please email Jackie at Jacqueline, J-A-C-L-Y-N, at C-A-I-N-J dot org. Just a note that you must be uh, in presentation for the entire time in order to uh, receive a certificate. I would now like to introduce Stephen Malenik, the Vice Chair of our Membership Committee. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Angela. Thanks for letting me crash the party. Uh, as Angela said, I am Steve Malenik. I'm the Vice Chair of the Membership Committee. I'm also a partner with Greenbaum, Rose Smith, and Davis. Uh, but I was asked to open up this event being part of the membership committee to, to remind many of you who are either new to the association uh, or have been around for a while and uh, have your memberships coming up. Obviously, it's been a tough year for all of us. We haven't been able to hold a lot of events, but uh, as you're seeing through events like like the one that you're about to listen to and, and every week, uh, CEI has been doing a great job of keeping uh, you know our membership engaged both from an educational front uh, and also a networking front, which are are two of the main pillars of CAI. You know, certainly with home for homeowner leaders, uh, as an attorney, the number one recruiting tool I have is the ADR program, which is just fantastic um, and a very cost effective way to fulfill your legal obligations. Um, your boards, uh, when they're educated, they're knowledgeable and prepared. That's what makes for the best board, and CAI certainly provides that. Um, CAI has a robust library of content for community leaders and uh, provides these ongoing virtual learning opportunities. And another example is, is going to be next Thursday, November 5th. Uh, save the date for the, the CAI roundtable, uh, which is free for homeowner leaders and managers. Uh, and speaking of managers and management companies, you know, access to the print and online directory of industry leaders helps your community navigate in these unparalleled times. Um, and of course, you can continue to earn education credits at a free or discounted rate uh, by being a member. And, and as you're seeing, we're getting emails uh, all the time. The virtual trade show uh, provides a great opportunity for you to navigate through all of our top industry professionals when you need to go out and hire a vendor. And certainly, finally, for our business partners, uh, we've had a continued opportunity to build your brand. Uh, we're committed to helping you with platforms such as our online Zoom seminars and providing the necessary education to support your business. And we've also had a numerous network networking opportunities. Our, our business partners committee uh, holds roundtables and get together. So it's it's been great um, throughout these times to still be able to get together, albeit virtually. So the virtual expo is launched. Please visit CAINJ.org to see the schedule of the, of the video releases and what's available <coughs> now. Every Wednesday, there are webinars at noon. Um, for edu free educational seminars, allowing for CEU is for those who need accreditation. Um, we mentioned next Thursday's event, and then of course this Friday, uh, and, and I think every Friday, right guys, that there's HOA Feud, which is a very fun, um, takes no more than a half an hour time to watch business partners and managers battle it out in a, uh, for, for uh, bragging rights. So again, if your membership is coming up, we encourage you to stick with it. Uh, CEI offers a lot of uh, great benefits. If you're a new member or you're thinking about joining, you're not a member yet, um, these are some of the benefits, but certainly reach out to me, anybody in the membership committee, anybody with CAI to learn about more. So uh, that's all I have. Thanks for, for uh, the opportunity and the time. Thank you, Steve, for that update. I would now like to welcome our LAC committee chair and also partner, George Gratrix, Esquire of Hillwallop. Welcome, George. Thanks, Angela. Hi, everyone. I'd, I'd like to first thank Angela and Jackie and Robin and everybody at the CAI chapter office for all the work that they've done on this program for us as well as throughout the year. We couldn't do it without them, so thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to welcome all of the attendees. I'm looking at our numbers right now. We have 126 folks that are listening in. That's terrific. Uh, each time we've done this, we've had well over 100 attendees. Uh, it shows the popularity of the program, and we hope that the information that we provide to you guys is, uh, is helpful in, in your uh, daily work on behalf of common interest communities in New Jersey. Uh, for those of you who have, have um, joined us before, welcome back. And for those of you who are visiting us for the first time, we hope you find this informative. I'm sure that you will. Um, this is really a follow-up uh, legislative update from the one that we did, our first virtual one that we did in July. 
and the great you know the great thing about these video platforms is is it looks like we'll be able to do these more often uh, than we had in past years. In past years, we would only do a couple of year uh, in-person events, uh, but it looks like we'll be able to do uh, more of these to keep you, you all of you abreast of all the legislative and regulatory happenings uh, in our state as it relates to us here in the industry. Uh, I, I, I can't uh, proceed without making a quick plug on behalf of our Legislative Action Committee here in New Jersey. Some of you may have heard this, but for those of you who didn't, I'm very proud to announce that CAI National has named the New Jersey Legislative Action Committee as the, the Legislative Action Committee of the year in the entire nation. So uh, I can't tell you how proud I am of my colleagues and friends that are on the committee for their selflessness and their dedication to the cause. Uh, way to go, gang. All right, so let's jump right in and I'm going to tell you uh, who it is that uh, you'll be hearing from today. First, we're going to hear from Paul Rach and Ed Stan George, who will be discussing the status of immunity legislation and how and if it can help common interest communities during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Uh, the last one of these uh, updates that we did back in July, spent, we spent most of our time on those uh, immunity questions. Paul is a homeowner leader member of the New Jersey LAC, having served as president of the board of his homeowners association in Mays Landing. And Ed is the president of Integra Management, which is headquartered in Mount Arlington, New Jersey. Then you're gonna hear from uh, Vinnie Hager, who will again be discussing insurance issues related to COVID-19. He'll be updating us on his report during our last virtual LAC update in July. He's the, he's the president of JGS Insurance located in Holmdale, New Jersey. Jim Maggot and Glenn Masulo will be discussing the governor's executive orders during the pandemic and how they led to the closing of amenities and facilities in common interest communities and whether the lifting of, those, of that lockdown has led to a reopening of any of those amenities. I think you all know some of the answers to that already. Jim's a vice president at FS Residential Management Company headquartered in Eatontown, and Glenn is the president of Preferred Community Management Services headquartered in Somerset. Dave Ramsey will update us on the status of the chapter's appeal of the DCA, uh, the DCA's Radburn regulations. He is a partner in the law firm of Becker, Becker and Polyakoff in Morristown, and is a fellow in the CAI College of Community Association Lawyers and also, I think, David, you're former chair of the LAC, right? I am. Matt Earl will update us on the legislative activities surrounding electric vehicle charging stations in common interest communities, including a bill that was just signed into law by the governor, which we're happy to report. Matt's a partner in the law firm of Cates, Nussman, Ellis, Ferry, and Earl, which is located in Hackensack. And um, I say this tongue in cheek, he's our reluctant expert in all things related to green energy. Tom, uh, Tom Martin will update us on the status of the various pending bills which seek to curtail, if not completely stop, efforts to collect debts during the pandemic, including common interest communities. He's a partner in the law firm of Price, Meese, Schulman, and Darminio, which is located in Woodcliffe Lake. And Tom is also a former chair of our LAC. And last but not least is our professional lobbyist, Michelle Jaker, who will give us the inside scoop on what's happening in Trenton surrounding each of these issues. She is a partner with MBI Gluck Shaw, and her office is in Trenton right across the street from the State House. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Paul and Ed and let you uh, tell us about immunity legislation. Paul, you sound like you're muted, or you don't sound like you're muted. No. Angela, are you able to help us out with Paul? Paul? I just unmuted myself, I think. There oh, you there go. You go. There. You're there. You're good. All right, thanks, George. Uh, good afternoon, all. My friend Steve Crow and I wrote an article in Community Trends this summer about the untenable situation board members faced regarding opening the pools and common elements. A very strong resident push to open or potentially huge uninsured exposure to associations as well as personal liability to board members. 
As a result, 84% of pools in New Jersey did not open this year, yet residents still had to pay for clubhouse and pool and gym and other amenities. So I asked my Legislative District 2 Assemblyman if they would be interested in introducing liability immunity legislation. They agreed and sent us a draft bill in August, but uh, we felt it would, would not solve the insurance issue, had little, little likelihood of passing or getting signed by the governor. After more study, the LAC decided the no cause of action or the approach would be the best bet. Assemblymen, Assemblymen Mazio and Armado from the second district are having it drafted by Office of Legislative Services. Ed will now further discuss the problems boards have, problems boards have, potential bills, and why no cause of action is best for us. Okay, thank you, Paul. Can everybody see that? Is that okay, or is that big enough? I see it. Yep. Okay. So, what? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you uh, very much for uh, attending, and, and to all the participants, thank you for all your effort. Um, as I say many times, things that I do is because I stand on the shoulders of others. So, uh, this chart um, is uh, a joint preparation of several people. In terms of uh, these are the current nine or ten. Uh, different um, statutes uh, that are out there in New Jersey. I'll talk about these first. Uh, I'd like to talk briefly about what has happened in other states, and then lastly, I'll wrap up with uh, where we stand with any federal uh, action. So this chart uh, shows uh, the legislative number on the far left column, uh, the, the beneficial immunity, the, the group, if you will, that uh, this may apply to, the status of the legislation, the data was introduced, and the legal category are broad or narrow in terms of uh, how effective it is in, in the protection. And the negligence exception turned out to be yes in all cases, um, but while I was logging, I didn't know if I'd have any no's. Um, and then lastly, who, uh, le uh, who are the uh, protected classes and who the, who the protection is for? So if you look at this list, um, there's only one that passed uh, the legislature, and that's legislation. Uh, that's the first, uh, A3951. Uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, A3910 uh, uh, for healthcare workers. Uh, this passed in April. Um, it's, it's a broad form of, of coverage, and this applied to healthcare professionals um, and facilities and provided immunity liability for certain claims. Um, of injury and death. Um, and this this is a, uh, a reoccurring thing that happened both at national and through many states, as I'll talk about later. So our healthcare providers and facilities do have immunity protection. Thereafter, it's um, a lot of acts and statutes that are pending. Um, A3951 is uh, for employers. It was introduced in April. Um, it's a narrowly based category and there is a negligence exception and this is for persons firms or corporations and partnerships and this provides for civil immunity for employers so this is um, a protection for employers uh, some of our associations certainly are employers but that that's not going to work for the the board of trustees and others um, a4189 and by the way there were dual designations you know between assembly and senate i'll just recite the assembly uh, this is for businesses uh, introduced in July. Um, this, the, the, uh, this is for um, employers, partnerships, um, and, and associations and business trusts and legal representatives. And this is for immunity to claims arising out of exposure at premises owned and operated uh, by the employer during the activity. So this is sort of a premises. Uh, based um, operation for, for immunity for those entities listed. A4377 is for business and nonprofits and uh, higher education. Uh, it was introduced in July. It, it's for businesses, trustees, directors, and officers, agents, and servants. Um, there is no liability for employee illness or damages. That's pretty, pretty narrow. Um, what you'll see in this uh, listing, by the way, when especially in the protected class categories, are the different organizations or entities or individuals or persons that are identified in the class. 
and and each of these classes have a very different meanings uh, to uh, the, the legal world, and at times they can be uh, too restricting and may not as nicely cover um, associations and or those associations uh, and, and those companies that are supporting associations. I, I'll just want to remind everybody, as we said last time, that the, the chapter has asked us to try to provide some sort of immunity legislation for all interest groups that serve our association, associations. So these different entities and names and individuals and persons at times would be in conflict. And so when you look at those designations, if, if you don't see the right names, we're not going to have uh, the, the, the coverage. The next two are for school districts. So likely, as you might expect, uh, the schools in, in the state of New Jersey uh, wanted some immunity protection. They have sought uh, some language. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on these, but you can see that they haven't gone too, too far, it would appear. They've both been referred to uh, the Educational Committee, but they are another uh, individual discipline, if you will, that's uh, beyond the health care providers uh, that are looking for some uh, immunity protection. Um, A4388 um, is for businesses. This is supplementing Title IIA, and we'll talk about IIA in a second with regard to our application. That was introduced in July, and this is for uh, businesses as employers for their premises and has to do with immunity for damages to individuals as long as the business can document adherence to all regulations and guidelines. So this is going to be, you know, paper document intensive um, and uh, it probably is not going to fit for um, our, our interests um, in, in uh, community associations. Um, A4390, uh, age-restricted associations, you know, we're getting warm because we're getting to at least associations. This was, you know, intended to be sort of specific to them, but, and, and offered a broad amount of coverage. Um, age-restricted associations, um, their members, employees, and agents. Agents became uh, a bit of a problem with definition uh, in terms of who, in fact, would be an agent. I think we were comfortable saying managing agents would fall into that categories. But whether the pool operators or some of the janitorial companies uh, would fit in uh, was not, uh, you know, clear um, and risky business if we really got behind this. Um, and this is for an act or omission um, in, in the course of um, maintaining and operating common elements at uh, an age-restricted community. And while this is nice for age-restricted communities, it would do nothing for the rest of the, the marketplace in terms of other associations. Um, A4440 um, is uh, for entities and governments um, uh, supplementing Title IIA. Um, and again, this sort of, I think is just more demonstrative that uh, other, other entities, including governments and certain nonprofits in higher education, were looking for immunity protection. And this was based on simply uh, a good faith uh, effort and a reasonable compliance with law regulations would give you the immunity protection. Uh, if you were acting in that that sort of good faith, um, A4497 landlords and landowners uh, introduced in August. Uh, this was, uh, you know, specifically to um, landlords uh, for rental properties. Um, I don't recall it distinguishing, excuse me, between residential and or commercial, um, but uh, clearly it was intended just for those. Uh, landowners and landlords for immunity from claims from tenants, leases, uh, or invitees and trespassers. And again, this was an action of omission um, of a landlord. Um, I, I'm not sure I would be comfortable um, wanting immunity just for an act of omission, or, or would the legislature want to give us immunity for an omission? Uh, I think that I think that's problematic. Um, the um, next one is, uh, last one really is A4565, Youth Sport and Senior Planned Real Estate Developments. I'm not sure how these two got linked together in, in, a, in a form of legislation, but I think it's nice. Um, and this would apply to uh, youth sport leagues uh, so that uh, children and coaches and programs could, could operate and have immunity protection without any fear of uh, running those things. And so again, this is immunity for civil damages as a result of an act or omission at an event that you have uh, some control over. So again, what's, I guess, um, uniform to all of these are two things. One is that uh, none of them have really moved very far. 
Um, this speaks to perhaps um, the appetite for the legislature to uh, give immunity. Um, the second thing is they all have the negligence exception, which would be for you would not have protection. You would not have protection if you were acting uh, in a gross or willful, willfully negligent way. So in all cases, you're not off the hook if you really go off, off the rails and do something silly and are totally negligent. So what the, the um, Black Committee then did, and with the help of our, our attorneys in particular, because somebody like me would not know this, um, there is um, legislation uh, or statutes um, in New Jersey uh, that relate to um, Title uh, 2A and Section 53A um, provides for immunity from liability for negligence, uh, and it applies to nonprofits, uh, societies, associations uh, that are organized for charitable educational purposes and defines uh, their board of trustees. And 2A 53A provides then, therefore, for some general immunity from liability. Uh, that seemed to be a great start. And so what we did is then crafted, uh, get back to my screen, hold on a second. Uh, then with, again, with the aid of some of our attorneys and then Paul's effort with the two assemblymen, um, we've come up with uh, the no cause of action um, amendment, if you will, adding on to uh, title uh, 2A53 and adding section 49. So there are 48 sections previous to that. So there's lots of other ways they slice and dice this legislation. So the, the verbiage that we have submitted to the offices of legal services, as Paul mentioned, is uh, the following. No cause of action shall accrue for any illness, injury, death, or other damages arising from or related to exposure to or transmission of the novel coronavirus, uh, SARS, COVID-2, uh, or, or any other variant to the extent that said exposure or transmission occurred on the premises of a residential or mixed use condominium association, homeowners association, cooperative, or other residential common interest community. And B is nothing in the subsection shall be deemed to apply to any claim for illness, injury, death, or other damages caused by any gross or willful negligence. So back to that negligence exception. What this does is clearly define that mixed use condos, HOAs, cooperatives, and other residential common interest communities are made applicable uh, to the immunity language uh, that is defined in uh, Title 2A. Um, I gather when the Office of Legal Services drafts, there'll be uh, some other explanations and qualifications associated with that. And there may be some other uh, protective language, but that's our interest. And I, I don't think that has been drafted yet. We're hopeful that that'll come out of draft uh, pretty soon. So that sort of concludes, um, you know, my analysis of the legislation that's out there and how some are, uh, what some of the pros and cons are. What I'd like to do is just cover um, what we see in other states. Uh, Matt did cover this last time in July, but maybe just with some updates. And thank you, Vinny, for the list that you provided to us. So from that list, uh, there were 30 states uh, throughout the country that have en enacted some form of immunity protection. Um, there are, I think, nine states that carved out very specific immunity for the very specific operations. The other 21 were immunity protections for healthcare workers and health facilities, so similar to what we did in New Jersey and similar to what the, uh, the federal government did at the federal level. So our, our health care providers and our health care facilities do have their relatively limited immunity protection uh, under various state and federal laws, and that's uh, an appropriate and good thing. So what Louisiana did is they gave immunity protection for takeout restaurants, whether it's a you know, McDonald's type place or any restaurant that now, uh, because of certain lockdown conditions, became a takeout restaurant, where maybe they didn't before they've uh, provided some immunity protection. Uh, Michigan uh, gave protection to businesses so long as they fully comply with all orders uh, and guidelines. So all those reams of paper of things you'd have to be completely conversant with and make sure you comply and if you deviate you're in trouble. 
Mississippi had a very broad definition of business entities and, and offered an, uh, immunity uh, for, for those businesses in that definition. Nevada did a broad definition of covered entities and required that the plaintiff must prove the gross negligence. Now, um, I, I think that's always the case, but I guess you can start bringing your, your cause of action, but you're gonna have to meet the burden of gross negligence in order to get the immunity. Um, North Carolina gave immunity to essential businesses, and I, I won't go into all the definitions of what they were, but you can imagine. So their view of essential businesses were given some special immunity protection. Uh, Ohio businesses uh, must uh, be in full compliance with the guidelines and state orders. I think that was similar to, to Michigan. Uh, Oklahoma, I thought was actually interesting. Uh, it had a broad entity uh, description, uh, but must be in full compliance of guidelines and state orders. Uh, Tennessee allows for a person to bring a claim if they can prove gross negligence. Again, that's probably similar to Nevada. And Utah, which I know uh, Matt spent some time on uh, the last time, was a good one too that gave immunity uh, for on-premises or operation, uh, something that we are uh, suggesting uh, be continued in our um, action. So those, those, that's the activity at the other states. That's not a lot, folks. And, and again, I wanna just speak to um, what we're up against in terms of getting immunity. Um, and you know, we feel that there's maybe some difficulty with the legislature and what their appetite may be for immunity. Um, and, and so this is, uh, while a, a noble ask, uh, not, this is a major lift uh, for even the best of us uh, at this committee and with the advice and, and our, our um, uh, assistance at the, with uh, Michelle's uh, firm. So on a federal level, just very quickly, um, HR 6800, uh, Title III, uh, named COVID-19 Every Worker Protection Act of 2020. I think that's part of the House uh, Heroes Act. Uh, this is sort of the Democratic uh, sponsored uh, immunity protection. It's actually not immunity protection. It, it grants the ability for workers' comp claims to be filed for any sort of you know, illness or death associated with COVID and uh, provides uh, and, and or obligates employers to um, provide um, proper protection uh, for their employees as they should, um, but it's not really an immunity protection act. Um, in the Senate, under um, Senator McConnell, S-4775, Title II Coronavirus Liability Relief, this one goes into a, um, I, I think, an appropriate approach to immunity, uh, goes out of its way to identify that the COVID-19 virus and pandemic has created significant economic uh, and, and health crises to uh, our businesses and operators and that they should not then now be further burdened with uh, lawsuits. And so there would be regulations written uh, that if a lawsuit was to be filed, there would have to be substantial reason why it would have to be justified and those regulations aren't there. But I thought that that actually did represent an appropriate approach to immunity and recognized the damages to businesses that would occur if there is a flood of litigation uh, by all sorts of types that might want to get into the game of litigating on somebody's behalf. So that's my uh, conclusion on the um, uh, the three areas of coverage, New Jersey, other states, and federal. Paul, I know you wanted to make a little pitch about uh, presenting this legislation and how we go forward, so I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Still muted, Paul. Paul. <clears throat> Here we got you. Paul. Oh, yes. All right. Thank you. Yes, indeed, I am. Uh, and uh, passage will be a daunting battle, but uh, I, I believe in the democratic process, and I feel that the 1.5 million residents of the nearly 7,000 common interest communities in every legislative district can be a very powerful faction to fight for the legislation. We need it to ease opening pools and gyms. A repeat of this problem next year will be awful. Not all HOAs have pools and gyms, but likely virtually all age restricted communities do. So hopefully we can 
in, in, enlighten our members and all residents of New Jersey to agree with Vince and Vince Mazio and John Armato that uh, the bill is worth passage once it gets introduced. And I'm sure George will send an email to everyone's announcing that it has been introduced. And that's it for me. Okay, thanks so much, Ed and Paul, for your comprehensive update. Um, I'm going to jump over to Michelle, and, and Michelle, you you heard a couple of times uh, Ed mentioned, you know, about the appetite in Trenton for these types of immunity uh, bills. Uh, and as he he went down his list, you saw that there were a number of bills that have been pending for some time now um, on behalf of you know very worthy groups, folks that are entitled to have this kind of protection, and yet. Uh, it hasn't moved. So tell us what you know on the ground in terms of whether there is an appetite for this type of legislation in Trenton right now. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, you know, you, you see this on the federal level. Uh, this The issue of immunity has actually been a major wedge between the two parties um, as they've been negotiating a stim stimulus package. Um, and that plays out, you know, almost in the same way here in New Jersey. Um, I think, you know, our governor shut things down uh, you know, was one of the most comprehensive shutdowns that you've seen um, and, and was very slow to open things back up. Um, and you heard repeatedly from the governor that he wanted people to open up responsibly. Um, you know, he had his trademark line about knucklehead behavior. Um, and, and, you know, the governor has been firm and consistent um, in that you know, he really wants to see businesses that are going to open take on the responsibility um, and the onus for making sure that their their facilities are clean and sanitized and safe. Um, so there really has not been much of an appetite um, in the governor's office to expand immunity beyond, you know, I think Ed mentioned the first, one of the first bills they passed was immunity for healthcare workers. Um, there, there's not been much interest um, from the governor's office in expanding beyond that. Um, there's been, you know, as you see with the, the number of bills that have been introduced, um, there is some interest uh, within the legislature, um, but it is, it is a, it's a, it, it's a, you know, a big mountain for us to climb on this. Every interest group, whether it's bar, you know, bars, higher ed, college, uh, schools, um, rec leagues, everybody who wants to reopen wants an immunity bill. Um, so I think at the end of the day, uh, you see Republicans that have gotten behind this. Um, you've seen some Republicans, kind of, I'm sorry, some Democrats kind of cherry pick their favorite issues and introduce an immunity bill to protect them. Um, but you haven't seen any sort of comprehensive negotiation around immunity at this point. Um, and I think you also, uh, you know, we started to hear towards the end of the summer when some of the reporting about nursing homes came out that they were actually looking to roll back the immunity protections that they had passed earlier for um, healthcare workers and nursing homes. So, you know, it, what I think will happen here is that this is going to play out for a little bit longer. Um, you know, we're we're starting to head back into you know another wave um, with you know the city of Newark doing some additional shutdowns now. Um, you know, as businesses and residents of New Jersey start to get, you know, more antsy about things happening, there may be a conversation about mm -hmm. immunity, um, but it will be a, a negotiation between the two parties, um, and they would have to get the buy-in of the governor, who at this point, you know, really like, likes to see individual responsibility on this. So with regard to our bill, the one that we have proposed on behalf of common interest communities, uh, we've gotten the approval of the two assemblymen to introduce it, but we understand that it's it's uh, taken the normal route of going into the Office of Legislative Services um, for their approval. And uh, tell us what you expect the, the road will be for us to get this introduced. And then I'll follow up with a question on the back end of that. Sure. Um, yeah, you know, there's always anytime you, ha you have a legislator and you want them to introduce a piece of legislation, there's a back and forth where you work with them before um, the bill is introduced. That's just putting pen to paper, making sure that you know they define things as things should be defined, and that um, you know how they've worded the immunity protections in the legislation actually provides you with the protections that you need. Um, so I know you know Paul and 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 Dave and others on this on this um, panel have done a really good job in working with the legislative offices to communicate. 
um, how this piece of legislation could protect common interest communities. Um, that all takes time to make sure that the words that end up in a piece of legislation actually do what we had hoped for them to do. Um, so that's what's happening right now. Um, I think that you will see, um, and then there's a whole process where you can, you know, propose a bill for introduction on one day and then it's formally introduced on another day. So you have to follow the legislative calendar on that. Um, I think that we'll expect to see that bill um, introduced within the next couple of weeks. It will be referred to the appropriate committee. Um, it could be assembly housing um, unless, you know, somebody in leadership sees it fit to send someplace else. Um, and then quite frankly, I, I anticipate that it will sit there um, for a little bit like all of these other immunity bills until leadership in both houses um, or the governor uh, get some push to, to do something on this. And then I think it'll get rolled into a larger conversation about immunity and how do you protect both, you know, opening the pools, that's a huge issue, um, and sports, you know, kids sports leagues and, and, and whatnot. So once our bill is introduced uh, and it takes that process, if you just as you've just described, how do how we're going to be we're going to be there alongside of all these other worthy groups? How do we separate ourselves? How do we get our message out there to uh, legislators that that um, we deserve the the consideration that the others haven't gotten so far? I think you have to personalize it, right? You know, I'm sitting here today, coming live from my living room. I've got two kids upstairs who are remote schooling and youth sports for, for me has been, you know, the lifesaver. Uh, if there's a threat that youth sports are going to shut down, you know, that's something that parents, uh, you know, that I'm friends with will start to, to yell and scream about and legislators will start to get some pressure on it. You know, these are, the, these are the concerns of their voters. Um, and I think that that's true of common interest communities as well. I mean, you offer People pay fees, um, you know, for the the for you know use of your recreation facilities, um, you know, and and I do. I'm going to lump you into to youth sports. Um, you know, the ability to have your pools open during the summer is a huge benefit. We've learned a lot about this virus over the past couple of months. You can probably safely open your pools at this point. Um, these were things that we didn't necessarily know at the beginning of this past summer. Um, so I think that that's the message uh, that you want to get, you know, all politics is local. Um, legislators, you know, talk to your, you know, people who live in your communities all the time. Um, and to the extent that, you know, your membership and your, your you know, people who, um, who live in these communities can communicate to their legislators that, look, you know, we're being responsible. We want to do this safely. This is how we're going to do it. Um, but we do need protection because at the end of the day, you know, this is not something that you could 100% control for. You know, George, if I could just jump in, it, it, the, the experience with pools for the small number that opened, fortunately, it wasn't disastrous. But now we're all dealing with gyms. That's the latest thing. And of course, epidemiologists tell us that gyms are among the most risky propositions that are out there. So, you know, I just want to follow what Michelle just said by saying, be careful um, because somebody's going to be talking about the governor's orders, and I'm sure this will come up in that presentation. Um, but operating a gym, particularly after we hear from Vinny and the, his issues about insurance, is probably a pretty dangerous thing to be doing at this point. And the lack is not recommending that individual associations open their, uh, particularly their interior amenities. Thanks, David, and, and thanks, Michelle. Okay, so Vinny, you've heard why we're pursuing immunity legislation, and it's because we don't have that insurance coverage that would protect us from those kinds of claims. So tell us where we stand with, uh, with insurance coverages these days. Well, thank you, George, uh, and thanks, Dave, for the lead-in. Um, I will say, to to start, um, you know, the, one of the positives uh, from this experience, from the Zoom and and from working from home, is the occasional uh, treasure hunt you have to go on for things like today, like going to find pants or a sport jacket or even a sport jacket that fits, um, is always a little treat that we get to we get to enjoy once in a while. So thank you for that today. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about. The insurance coverages and, and and what are some of the hurdles that we're seeing um, from the carriers to respond 
to these COVID-19 claims. Um, you know, and, and hurdles, by hurdles, I mean exclusions and, and policy language. So first let's look at the general liability. You know, so general liability is gonna cover typically your bodily injury and, and third party, uh, you know, property damage claims. Somebody that slips and falls on the property gets injured or catches COVID or that, uh, you know, some property damage, some third party property damage happens. These are what's called occurrence policies, right? They're date certain. On the date that this happened is the trigger for that policy to respond to cover uh, or defend the, the claim or the allegation. Um, the problem that you have with these COVID things, particularly if you have opened up your amenities, is there is no one certain date that you can point to to say that I was exposed to uh, this person or was I exposed to uh, COVID-19 and that's how I caught it. Um, it's going to typically happen over a period of events, unless you host a, a large outdoor event and you know a lot of people catch it, um, it's very difficult to determine that date certain. Uh, and the, the other part of it is, you know, another hurdle, a big hurdle that you have to get over is the causation, right? The causation is what was it caused by? Is it resulting from or arising out of what actions of the association that caused me to uh, contract COVID-19? Uh, unless you've been living in a bubble for the last eight months, uh, you have gone to the grocery store, or you have gone to the drugstore, uh, you probably have ventured out and, and eaten outside somewhere. So to be able to say that I was exposed because I went into the gym at the association or I went into the clubhouse or I went to the pool or whatever amenity I was using um, and I had an exposure and that's where I caught it is a very, very difficult hurdle to, to uh, overcome. Uh, we don't have a very good tracing um, policy in place. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to get there, but it's still very difficult. It's really important if you did open up your pools or your amenities that you are documenting who's coming in and, and, and who's using it and when they and they leave. So if there is an exposure that you can actually go ahead and um, you know do the proper protocols and notifications. The other issue that happened, you know, back in 2003 when we were, uh, we had a big SARS uh, uh, um, uh, outbreak and then subsequently Ebola, uh, the insurance industry uh, implemented CPO 140706, which is basically the exclusion of loss due to virus or bacteria. These policies came, uh, this endorsement came onto most policies starting in 2006 and have been there ever since as a result of uh, the SARS and the Ebola outbreaks that they got. Um, it, you know, it's very clear, uh, it's a virus, it's not going to have any defense or any coverage or from a bacteria type of exposure. Uh, more recently, and you probably have seen this now on most of your renewals, probably starting in June or July, uh, we started to see a communicable disease exclusion that's being put on most of the package policies, umbrella policies, DNO policies, um, you know, based upon or arising out of the exposure to infected individuals or animals. Um, you know, predominantly most of the carriers that are, are, are providing property and, and liability coverage in the state of New Jersey have added these communicable disease exclusions to the policy. And it's just more of a clarification of the virus and the bacteria, um, just to say that this extends to a communicable disease type of exposure. Last, uh, or, you know, last and not least, if you're able to get through all of those other hurdles, um, the other big hurdle that you'd have to get by is probably the first exclusion that you're gonna find in the policy when you get to the exclusion section of the policy, it's called expected or intended injury. So bodily injury, property damage, expected or intended from the standpoint of the insured. Most people, if you know, if you talk to them, understand if you open up your facilities and you allow more people and more people to get uh, exposure to one another, it's expected that they're going to catch or, or, or catch COVID-19. Um, so this is another big hurdle that you would have to overcome just to trigger a defense from the general liability exclusions. If you're able to overcome all of those hurdles, then you may be able to find a defense. But I can say our experience since March has not been any of these uh, types of claims have been uh, provided any defense or coverage. So let's move on to the, the DNO policies, the directors and officers of liability. And this is the most important for obviously all the volunteers and the directors, including the management companies, uh, that are out there, this, these are policies for wrongful acts. These are not, I was injured because of a bodily injury or a slip or a property damage, a slip and fall. 
this is a decision that you made or that you didn't make that I didn't particularly care for. They're emotional claims. They're claims that um, are not driven because they were uh, wronged and have caused injury or, or by money or, or, or personal injury. Um, these are, are claims that, uh, again, they're acts or decisions that you're going to make or not make. Um, and different from the liability policies, these are claims made policies. So the trigger for this policy or this type of defense is when the claim is made. So the action may have happened in March of, of 2020, when your policy renewed in July of 2020, the current policy was the one that will respond to these types of DNO claims because it's when the date of the claim is brought, not when it actually happened. Um, and, and the biggest hurdle, particularly for the directors and officers liability is uh, the exclusion for bodily injury and property damage claims. And you know, as, as you can read here, exclusion is applicable to all loss. They're not liable to make any payment for loss, shall have no duty to defend or pay defense expenses in connection with any claim made against the insured based upon directly or indirectly arising out of or any way involving bodily injury um, or property damage. And when you're looking at property damage, you're looking at damage to tangible property, loss of use or destruction or de deterioration of any tangible property Fair to supervise, repair, and maintain tangible property. This has always been on the directors and officers liability policies. Um, and the reason it's there is the bodily injury and property damage is typically is gonna have your coverage under the general liability policy. So this in, did not enable you to kind of double tap, get, in, uh, get payment from the GL policy and now go after the, the DNO policy. Uh, this is the biggest uh, hurdle and probably the biggest, I would say, uh, biggest concern for most or all community associations, not just in New Jersey, but throughout the country, is this property damage um, exclusion on the DNO policy. It has been there forever, and it is a you know something that we have to be aware of. Um, so those are the, some of the exclusions that you're going to have to deal with on the DNO policy. Benny, can I interrupt for a second and just say, um, even though those exclusions are there in black and white, it, is is it recommended that if in fact one of our associations or boards got sued, that they should submit the claim anyway? Absolutely, either on the general liability or the directors and officers liability, let's put it through the process. You know, I was listening to, um, you know, Kevin Davis uh, Insurance Services is one of the larger producers for uh, community associations, directors and officers liability programs out there through Travelers. And he had a, a program recently and he was talking about since March, they've had over 400 COVID claims on their book of business. And, and you know, in the big sense of things, you know, they do thousands and thousands and thousands of community associations, that's not a big number, but there has not been many that have been able to overcome any of these allegations where they have provided a defense. So, you know, that is bearing out as far as we're seeing with our experience, um, as well as what our, um, you know, some of our competitors out there are also providing. But if you do get a claim, absolutely submit it and let's go through the process and, and let the carrier make that determination. That's not ours to make a determination or, or or the association's attorney, that's up to the carrier to do. So we would always recommend that you notify your agent and put the, put the carriers on notice for any claim that comes out of this. Um, you know, we've talked about tort immunity. Some of the associations do have tort immunity already passed within their uh, documents. They've either amended their documents at some point in time over the last 10 to 15 years, or some of the newer documents already provide tort immunity, but it only applies to unit owners and their spouses does not provide uh, immunity um, to the children or any um, any guests or anybody else other than the unit owners and their spouses. So it's a little bit of protection, but it's not a lot of protection, particularly, um, you know, if you have guests or, you know, anybody with children in the uh, communities. Local legislative immunity protection. Um, if one of the bills that Ed and, and uh, Paul and Michelle talked about should get through, um, somebody's ring is going off that. Um, this will give protection to associations, but it's not going to stop all claims. Uh, defense will still need to be provided for these types of claims, and it's not going to come, fortunately, from the DNO carriers or from the liability carriers. It should certainly reduce the number of claims, but the potential still exists. Um, a lot of these, you know, as, as Ed pointed out, have that exclusion for gross or wanton negligence or, or material misrepresentation of those things. Um, so if they feel that they can pierce that gross negligence, they're still going to try and sue and it still won't be covered by insurance. From the federal side, you know, most of from the insurance that we're seeing, 
most of the focus is really looking at business interruption types of coverage <laughs> to provide for the pandemic. Um, and, and this is for restaurants and, and other businesses that, you know, uh, retail that have had to close either um, by the governor's mandate um, or uh, they were unable to, to stay open um, through federal uh, mandates. Uh, the business interruption is not going to have right now. They, there's no coverage for business interruption or the loss of use of their, their facilities due to COVID because there was no physical damage to the premises. Now there's been a several hundred, if not thousands of these types of claims that have been and lawsuits that have been filed across the country. I will say there was one in North Carolina that hit this week um, where they did overrule the documentation or the, or the exclusion of the policy. And they said it was uh, there would be coverage under the civil authority, um, but that has already been appealed. And is, I don't expect that that's gonna hold up um, on the on appeal because the language is very clear on that, that there was no physical damage to the property. So most of the federal legislation that we're seeing that has some traction is on some sort of pandemic type of insurance, um, which will be modeled after the, the TRIA, which is the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, um, or the NFIP, which is the, the flood insurance program, or the crop insurance models. Um, there's three or four different plans out there that are being talked about that do have some support from the insurance industry, um, but you know that's a long way off, and I don't think anything is going to happen within you know before the end of this year, uh, or at least until we see what happens with the election next year. So what can the association do to protect against uh, some of these claims? You know, you need to develop, and I'm sure you already have, but make sure you have a written plan on managing an outbreak. Um, you need to appoint your COVID ambassador. Uh, you need to determine how and who to notify of positive tests. Uh, do not discriminate. You know, uh, there's a lot of talk about should we name that individual um, from a DNO perspective? We do not recommend you name individuals. We recommend that you notify people that they have been exposed to somebody um, and that they should uh, quarantine for two weeks and have themselves tested. But we do not propone anybody being named specifically without their written consent that you can name them. Um, and obviously follow all local, state, federal, and CDC guidelines, which is changing on, on a weekly basis, as you know. Whatever plan that you've got, you should be communicating that and writing and communicate often to the association and your membership. Whether you decide to open your amenities or close them, you should be using your reasonable business judgment, right? Fiduciary, good faith, loyalty, or do care. Um, you know, as, as David said, <clears throat> you know, what we're learning uh, each month or each week from this virus is um, you know, outdoor exposure is not as great as indoor exposure. When you get to indoor exposure, you're really looking at how is the air being moved, how is it being circulated, and how are you getting fresh air into those buildings. Um, so opening up a gym in, indoors or, or some of these smaller rooms, the card rooms, the billiard rooms, et cetera, those activities, um, you know, is, is not really recommended because it's, a you know, a longer exposure of 15 minutes or more to somebody who's who's got or has tested positive for COVID, um, that you have your biggest uh, experience and your biggest um, exposure to this type of a, a claim. So uh, we unfortunately are not recommending that you do that, but you know, if you decide to do that, uh, you need to document who's coming in, how long they're being there, so you can notify them should there be an exposure that goes out. Um, I will say I do have a few minutes. Uh, just one other thing that you should note um, <clears throat> that as a result of not just this, but you know, we've had the wildfires, we've had um, you know, 26 or 27 hurricanes or, or national uh, you know, uh, storms that have been hit that are coming through with over 200 billion dollars in damages. We are seeing uh, this is budget time, we are seeing a definite hardening of the marketplace. So, if you are budgeting uh, on a minimum, I would say between five to, to 10 percent uh, for those with clean claims activities. And those that are on the coast and those that have uh, losses um, and have had some troubles with their claims over the last few years, I would be budgeting for more than 10%, 10 to 15% uh, is what we're seeing across the board. There's been a constriction on the um, liability and the umbrella marketplace as a result of some of these social judgments that have been coming out. Previously, we would see, we would see a large judgment from a pool or something of around four or five million. We're starting to see much more higher claims of 25, 30, 35 million dollars um, 
in claims that are coming out. So the, the umbrella marketplace has really gotten um, tough and, and um, shrinking from a limit capacity as well as a pricing capacity. So that's all that I have for you. Thanks, George. Thanks so much, Vinny. Um, not great news, but uh, it's important for us to know whatever the news is, right? Okay, Correct. guys. So let's move. Let's move on to um, to Jim and Glenn. Uh, as we know, guys, back in March, when uh, when the governor and the state um, instituted the lockdown, um, it was done by executive order, and then those that lockdown began to slowly be lifted through executive order. So. Um, Tell us where we stand uh, with the state of the executive orders and, and where we are now with the use of amenities. So, is everyone can, can see my screen? Not yet. Okay. There we go. There it is. There you go. Got it? Good. Okay. So, what I intend to show is and make it easy for you know property managers, board members, et cetera, who need it is uh, if you, I have this all set up so that. If you click on it, you could go to the particular uh, orders or guidelines that were uh, uh, put out by either the federal or state government. And uh, these are different because these are executive orders versus the legislation that Ed uh, spoke about. Uh, the first thing I'm going to come to is the CDD, CDC guidelines, which are federal. Now. Standing alone, these are not laws upon the state when you take them alone. But almost all the orders incorporate them into the executive orders. So in, within those orders, they become uh, the law from the executive order. Uh, the first one uh, that uh, you see is uh, uh, from the CDC, and it has guidelines that particularly affect different uh, organizations or groups. And as if you look down this sheet, you'll see homeowners associations, which it, uh, is effect. And it gives you guidelines on how these things uh, come in. And you'll find out, even though you're gonna see in these orders that uh, these, a lot of things are permitted as uh, related to what, may, uh, what uh, Vinny said, things are permitted but it doesn't necessarily mean that you want to do these things because the restrictions on them are a regular minefield. One slip up and you have, uh, you have a problem. So, you know, it's telling you, you have to wear masks. You have to, you know, certain things, if you think you have it, you stay home. You have to have the right, uh, your right supplies. Uh, you have to display signs, proper hand washing. Uh, you have to promote things through messages. Uh, you have to maintain a healthy environment. So if you have something open, you have to show constant cleaning. Uh, you have to have an ambassador that was uh, stated before. So somebody gets something, that ambassador has to be able to deal with it. If you have laundry towels, you have to label containers. You have to uh, protect shared furniture. You have to have proper and adequate, adequate ventilation, whether whatever that might be. Your water systems have to you have to be taken uh, treatment of. So, you know, if somebody's coming to a common fountain, you and they're touching it, you have to deal with it. There has to be physical barriers. So, like if you were a gym, you might have to put barriers between those workout stations or keep some of them empty. Uh, uh, any kind of shared object has to be treated. Uh, you have to protect, uh, protect vulnerable staff. Uh, uh, you know, there's certain safety that lifeguards have to maintain, even in your water. And we know Lorder has chlorine, so it kills a lot of things. So you're, but you know, kids and stuff, they're in the water, their water spitting out of their mouth uh, from being in there. There's all kinds of issues that come into water and when you come out of it. So you want to make sure distances uh, are, are maintained. You have to be a re, you have to be aware of these regulations, uh, and they are quite extensive. Uh, uh, and this is only guidelines. What I'm showing you here: gatherings where you are in pools or you're in gyms where you customer in the past you all met up and talked to each other. Uh, those are restricted. Uh, 
you know, you have to have communication systems that are, you know, periodically and frequently announcing, you know, social distancing, et cetera. Uh, you have leave policies for staff. You have to have uh, backup staff. Uh, you have to train your staff, uh, particularly in these things. You have to have signs in all types of spots. And the list goes on. If you go to um, the next thing you'll see is guidelines. And if you see them on my list, you'll see department guidelines. This is the New Jersey state guidelines versus the federal guidelines. And you'll see most of these tend to mirror the federal, but they may go in you know, more detail as it relates to our state. And you see how they talk about uh, 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 you know, putting to effect different, different procedures your staffing of your pool. Now, if you're in New Jersey, these things even become more uh, particular on your event because they're coming from the state and the state uh, organization. And again, these relate to pools we're talking about right now, but they also overflow into gyms, et cetera. Remember now, most of the pools are closed, but in senior communities, particularly our high rises, some of those pools may still be open. Uh, because they have indoor pools. So, uh, and indoor pools, are, like we we discussed before, because they're inside, are more problematic. Uh, and you'll see you may have special events in your clubhouse. All these things are have particular sets of guidelines that you have to follow. Uh, next, you'll come to uh, gyms. And if you see, when we talk about it, there's certain ordinances. So, uh, 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 orders. So there was the original one for pools, or the more recent one was uh, order, uh, uh, number 153 for pools. And then we moved to gyms, where you see order 157, uh, which starts to talk about a little bit of them, but gyms are still closed at this time. And then you come to uh, order 181, which was put out in, uh, in August. Uh, around the 27th of August, this came out. And that's when we all heard about gyms being open, the gyms in your neighborhood, et cetera. And it's all reflected to our gyms also that may be in, inside gyms versus outside recreation, say like tennis courts or pickleball or something related to those, those items. And, and as you can see under gyms, there was, I, I included a thing on a summary of guidelines from gyms that came from order 181. And that has a whole staff uh, list of things that you would wanna go through to look at gyms. You also see in there, there's click-ons for the actual ordinance itself for gyms, for the executive order there's a click-on and it's departments. If you're not able to get these from Angela, please just email me, even if it's 100 of you, I don't care, I'll get them back to you. and. These are good reference points for you, easy to look at if you're unsure before you go and you can look at them, get familiar with them. And then of course, you want to discuss it with your particular firm or association's attorney on it. Because these, as we all, these will be interpreted slightly different as it, uh, and it reflects to different firms. And you really want to be guided by the firm that represents your organization. Um, in the end, you, you, you must remember that, just like I said, keep in mind, if you open up, that these things have a lot of different rules and ordinances as you go through them that will be, uh, that'll affect you. And uh, I would be very careful on doing anything that's, uh, that's indoor uh, be, because of the fact that there is no insurance to protect you. Uh, that ends what I have to say. Uh, that would bring on Jim that would follow me. And by the way, Jim is also a former chairman of LAC, uh, of LAC in case that wasn't noted before. Oh, Jim, I apologize, buddy. I got the wounds right here to prove it. Uh, <laughs> I owe you big time. Your time was, was going to pass during my term. It was going to pass. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Glenn, appreciate it very much. Thank you, George, and thank you everybody for attending today. You can relax your eyes a little bit. There's no PowerPoint here. It's a little bit of a conversation for the next few minutes about the amenities in your association. 
obviously these amenities are a large part of the reason that you probably chose the building or community that you live in today. However, the reality was that seven months ago, these amenities were abruptly closed uh, and taken away from you in terms of any access. After a few weeks of the shutdown, conversations began about reopening because who expected the pandemic shutdown to last for many, many months? There's been a flood of information from the CDC, Dr. Fauci, the World Health Organization, and local authorities. With, with this came varying opinions about how to best protect for the virus. Was it airborne? Was it surface? Was it contact? Exactly what was it? And as numbers of infection began to slowly decrease, we all became anxious. Then became a series of executive orders specifying what needed to happen in order for reopening. The key to interpreting these orders, I feel, is that if the community wants to follow very specific protocols and guidelines, the amenity can open. However, it is still, it, it was and it still is the board's decision as to whether or not the amenity should open. And I think that's really key. We keep about making this evaluation month after month after the situation has changed, things start to look a little bit more optimistic, and then now we're starting to see a resurgence. So we constantly have to adjust the plan. The first challenge we face is opening the outdoor pools, which initially seemed like it was pretty straightforward and a no-brainer. These are different times and a first time in our history for this type of situation. So there were new requirements for sanitization, which was a word we never heard before, not just cleaning. Spacing of the furniture for limited seating at the pool, reduced hours of operation, no guests were allowed in most of the pool facilities due to the limited seating. And a reservation system, you would have thought you needed that for a pool. Where do you get the technology? Where do you get the supplies? And where do you get the additional staff for the sanitizer? And how do we pay for these significant unbudgeted expenses? Well, as the various outdoor amenities, such as tennis courts and playgrounds, were gradually left open by executive orders, your legislative action committee worked diligently to clarify how these orders apply to common interest communities, and we continue to do so. Did the amenities in the executive order refer to municipal locations rather than those within a community association? The answer was often no. Private communities could remain closed. The reality here is that the municipalities have immunity from lawsuits, in this case regarding contracting COVID-19 in playgrounds. Etc. As you heard from Ed and Paul, there is some movement toward immunity legislation. Oh, and Michelle, I'm sorry, Michelle. There is some movement toward immunity legislation. However, this will likely take considerable time to clarify immunity within a common interest community. And Vince and Vinnie Hager told us the absence of insurance coverage and the potential claim defense. And this has been a major deterrent to reopening amenities. This continues to be a repetitive conversation as we move forward. With the Executive Order 157 and subsequently 181, the ability to open gyms in September, the challenges of opening our facilities continue. There is no simple solution, no size, no one size fits all. Each location has to do its own thing and establish its own protocols. Social distancing, ventilation, limited capacity, additional sanitation, you hear this repeated on and on. As we move into the winter months and many of our outdoor facilities and the parking lot activities, which have become very popular, such as bingo, movies, and outdoor dining become more unrealistic, what's next? With the recent news of the COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations on the rise again, I believe we all need to pause any plans of opening our indoor amenities. It is key to keep up the communication with your residents regarding the new and extensive requirements for enhanced air, fil air filtration and ventilation, continuing sanit sanitizing of the buildings, the outdoor, uh, sorry, um, and, and to open the facilities to residents and staff in a manner that's safe and realistic. And in most cases, probably for only a very few residents. We realize that the pressure continues to mount the longer these amenities remain closed and unavailable to you and fellow homeowners. However, we need to stay the course. 
Keep your homeowners informed regarding the tough decisions to be made. Share the data with them regarding the logistics to meet the requirements and related costs to reopen. They may not agree, but hopefully they will accept your decisions as valid business decisions. It is also critical to continue to provide sources of, of education, exercise, and entertainment for your residents to take advantage of online. At First Service Residential, we have been distributing bi-weekly newsletters and offering weekly webinars that have been well received and appreciated by the clients. It is imperative that all of us collaborate with one another including with your professional resources in order to successfully navigate the next months ahead. The reality is that as of today, less than 10% of our membership's amenities are open at even, a, at even to a limited extent, with only a few taking, uh, taking a benefit from that. So while we desire to get back to normal and, and the uncertainty of it all, confidence to reopen appears to be very shaky and something to reconsider every day. We'll get there sooner or later. Here's the 2021. Thank you, George. Thanks a lot, Jim, and thanks, Glenn. Um, uh, Michelle, don't go anywhere. I have a follow-up with you, but I wanted to do a couple of quick housekeeping things. Number one is um, all of the handouts and PowerPoints that you're seeing today are now available through your handouts tab, I'm told, uh, on your screen. And also, um, Angela tells me that all of those will be um, viewable on the uh, chapter's website as well. So not to worry about scribbling notes, you'll be able to see them directly. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is we're already at quarter after one, and we still have 150 folks uh, that, are, that are tuning in. We do have this space until two o'clock, so we may very well have to go past our 1.30 um, uh, time slot, but that's okay. Uh, and, uh, and also, I have been seeing that there have been a couple of questions coming in. Um, unfortunately, we, we can't, uh, we want to get as much of the substance out there before we start answering questions. What we can promise we'll do is that for those of you who have submitted questions, we'll make sure that we take note of them and try to get you answers. If not today, we'll, um, on, this, on this webinar, we'll do it uh, directly through email to you. So, um, getting back to Michelle, so Michelle, what do you hear on the ground in Trenton in terms of what direction are we heading with the governor's executive orders with regard to lockdown? Are they going to be in, uh, are they going to be locking down more? Do you think, or do you think they're going to be easing up as they have in the past month or so? That is the question of the day, um, and I don't have a crystal ball. Um, you know, the governor is going to be very hesitant to go back into lockdown. Um, I think what you're going to see, um, and, and it's very timely, I mean, you, the city of Newark just announced the whole, I mentioned this before, um, but they just announced the whole host of um, lockdowns specific to the city. Um, and there were some questions as to whether or not that viol violated the governor's executive orders um, and whether they were allowed to do that. Um, and as of this morning, the governor was allowing um, the mayor of Newark to put in any restrictions that he saw fit to do. Um, I think you're going to see, at least in the short term, um, and by short term, I, th I think I mean over the next couple of weeks, um, that type of activity play out. Um, you know, whether you know, it's not the summer, but, uh, you know, if we were in the middle of the summer and a, a, they closed the boardwalk, for example, you know, I think you're going to see things like that um, if our numbers continue to rise, and it looks like, unfortunately, that they will. Um, but I know that the governor um, has said, um, and I've had several conversations you know, with his staff, uh, that he really does want to approach this, uh, you know, whether we're still in the first wave or second wave, whatever you want to call it, but he wants to approach this new rising, you know, the, the increase in numbers with um, how he describes it as a scalpel. You know, in the beginning, they took drastic measures to close everything um, and very slowly reopened. Um, and they do want to keep what they can open. Um, so, you know, that's where we are as of today. Obviously, it's all going to be driven by our numbers. If we get into a situation like we were, um, I think that was back in April, where uh, capacity in, in hospitals and things like that uh, start to fill up. Um, then that's a different situation. 
Great, thanks. Okay, David, now on to something completely different, as they used to say on Monty Python. Um, can you tell us where we stand with uh, the RAD, but the appeal of the Radburn regulations? Uh, I certainly can, and uh, I want to join all the other uh, participants. Can you see my screen, by the way? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, I want to join all the other participants uh, uh, in saying thank you uh, very much for everybody who joined us today. Um, this is a very interesting legislative time. Uh, George made a reference to the fact that many years ago, I was the chair of the LAC, and I hate to even tell you what decade that was in, because it was a long time ago. Uh, so, uh, you know, back then, we probably had six or eight people on the LAC, and we might have had, oh, eight, ten pieces of legislation over a session that we were tracking. Uh, that was in the days before community associations started to get such attention from our legislators. Uh, these days, we tend to track over 100 bills. Uh, and in fact, uh, when you look at CAI National's website, who has a great website uh, for this, you'll see that New Jersey always tends to be among, have the most bills uh, that are uh, community association related uh, going on at any given time. So. Uh, turning to something, as George said, entirely new, we're dealing now with the rules that were adopted by the DCA in May of 2018. And we got a little excited about that when those rules came out. And the reason we got excited about it largely revolves around what this first slide shows, that they weren't in the Radburn law. Now, just to take you back very briefly, uh, in 2017, we were involved with Senator Gordon in drafting legislation that was balanced with regard to uh, open and fair and transparent elections. Um, he worked very closely with us. It didn't create for most associations any significant disruption in holding annual meetings or elections, but it did require those associations who were outside the norm, who were uh, not having elections conducted in a fair and open manner uh, to do so. So we endorsed that. Uh, we were happy with it. That legislation did not specifically have any provision granting the Department of Community Affairs any regulatory authority. Despite that, last year, DCA, of course, uh, put out uh, a lengthy set of regulations, not all of which even referred to elections, and as you know, the LAC uh, responded with a 25 or so page a letter uh, to DCA while those proposed regulations were pending. And many, many other associations and other organizations also commented, almost unprecedented in terms of community association regulations. We waited a long time from August of last year to May of this year, right in the middle of the pandemic, uh, and DCA announced its new regulations, making almost no changes whatsoever to their proposed regulations. So why, why are we so upset with this? Well, we're upset because uh, there, there's lots of new things in these regulations, not in the Radburn Law. Now, not all of them are we opposed to, but a lot of them are not authorized by statute. And, and, and I'll pick the first one, developer issues. Uh, there's now a provision that I think a lot of us would say, hey, this is a good thing. And that is to say that developers uh, cannot continue to control a board if all of the units they own are rented. And why is that? Because we do find at times that uh, developers, particularly during a down market, will hang on to control of an association for a very lengthy period of time, even though they're not selling units in the ordinary course of business. And how do you tell they're not selling units in the ordinary course of business? Well, they're renting all their units. So um, when that happens now, under these regulations, the developer has to give up control of the board. That's one, that's one that has nothing to do with elections, nothing to do at all, but it's in these regulations. The next thing we turn to, which does impact the, the uh, elections, are affordable housing issues. So 
you know, the first one, the first bullet point, I, we certainly don't object to. You can't prohibit affordable unit owners from participating in elections. Nobody, I'm not even aware that that was a problem to begin with, that they also have the same rights as market owners in terms of running for a board, voting in elections. Of course, nobody disputes that. Here's the bullet point, however, that has caused a lot of disruption. It says that every association with affordable units must reserve a seat on the board. And you might say to yourself, well, since the general co-op requirements were that 20% of the units had to be set aside for uh, affordable housing units and your typical board is five board members, reserving a seat is not such a terrible thing. The problem with this is, as with many of these regulations, one size does not fit all or even come close to fitting all. Uh, our firm represents an association with almost 600 units and seven affordable units. Those seven affordable units are entitled to one of seven board seats. And even though they represent a tiny, tiny percentage of the overall units. And it's not limited to that one association. I'm aware of other associations in much the same situation. So the affordable housing unit owners actually get a disproportionate representation. There was nothing ever prohibiting an affordable housing owner from running for a seat. I have other associations that have affordable units where affordable unit owners have won seats on the board subject to the standard election practice. I'm sure many of the other attorneys and managers on this uh, call also have had similar situations. So this was a this was a cure to a problem that didn't exist, but it, it's caused a lot of problems. Okay, uh, another bullet point. Again, this is not a biggie one way or the other. It basically says in mixed unit projects, the commercial units may not control the board. Uh, so if you have you know a first floor with a retail and the rest of the building is a mid-rise or high-rise with residential. I've never run into an association where the uh, commercial owners, they might've been reserved seats, but they never got to control the board. But it's not a bad thing. Uh, so we can accept that, that's fine. Owner entity representatives may not hold more than one board seat. This is actually, again, this is something we don't have an objection to. So that if you have an entity that holds, let's say they hold, five units, it's an LLC, and uh, they wanted to run one person from that entity for the board for one seat, and then the next election run another representative from that same entity for a board seat. They can't do that under this regulation. Without that, arguably, if you didn't have a provision in your bylaws that prevents an owner from having more than one seat on the board, arguably, you could do that. Again, uh, not anything we object to. Okay, now we get into the meat of this. Uh, call for nominations. Uh, this now says that you can't call for nominations more than 60 days before the notice of the meeting. Uh, I think anybody who's been through an annual election knows the minimum time period is 44 days before the actual annual meeting date that your call for nominations would have to go out. Um, but this says it can't be more than 60 days. So you've got a fairly tight window here. If you send it out 62 days before, does that mean your election's invalid? Arguably, um, I, I don't know why a court would find that objectionable, but again, this is not in the Radburn law. It's something dreamed up by the DCA. Um, any person not nominated by the deadline may be a write-in candidate. Nothing in the Radburn law provides for this. You have this very specific procedure in the Radburn law about being able to be nominated. Any person in good standing who's a unit owner can nominate themselves or another person. If you ignored that nomination process, why do you get to run as a write-in candidate? You'd have to ask the DCA. Um, they also added a provision that required notice to delinquent owners 30 days before the election. They also required that you state to all of those owners they have a right to ADR. So let's say you have a judgment against somebody for thousands of dollars in delinquencies. This says you have to offer them ADR. Why? 
you already went through the judicial process. You already have a, a, a judgment against them. You may be exercising on that. What is the purpose of ADR? There is no purpose to it. But again, this is somebody dreaming up their preferred provisions. That also provides you can become qualified to vote five business days prior to an election. Many associations have a record date when you have to be qualified. That's more than five days. In fact, under the Nonprofit Act, if you don't have a record date in your bylaws, it's 30 days before that you have to be in good standing. All ballots must be tallied publicly. Now, if this is if there was one thing that set us all <laughs> aflame in the middle of a pandemic when we're conducting our annual meetings on Zoom or WebEx or whatever, how are we going to accomplish this? Well, we've kind of done a Rube Goldberg approach. Anybody who's been through this knows we do the best we can. But this has introduced all sorts of new problems with proportional voting. So if you're a co-op who votes by shares or you're a condominium that votes by percentage interest, doing this anonymously introduces all sorts of issues that didn't previously exist. Um, the ballots must be open for inspection for a period of 90 days. Uh, obviously, if they're anonymous, that's not a big deal, uh, but that's in there and it's not in the law. It requires that electronic balloting be authorized by the bylaws. There's nothing in the Radburn Act that requires that. The Radburn Act specifically authorizes electronic balloting without requiring it being in your documents. Electronic noticing the Radburn law specifically says must be in your bylaws. So here, the DCA literally changed the statute. Again, you're wondering why we objected to this. We objected to it, and particularly during the pandemic, electronic balloting is becoming much more popular. It's a much more reasonable approach to voting anonymously than the whole double envelope system. And uh, it, it, it actually uh, is a shame that the DCA stuck this in. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this in detail. I'm just showing you the complications of the timelines with the introduction of the new uh, uh, provisions on notifying all delinquent owners at least 30 days before. It, it just becomes a much more complex uh, pattern we have to follow. Uh, I'm, follow. I'm finding many managers today said, just give me a timeline, just set forth the timeline when I, all these things have to be done by, because they're so fearful of missing a date uh, that they want to be sure that they're following the regulations to a T. Um, the notice of the meeting must contain a copy of the ballot. We're not really sure what that means, whether that means the absentee ballot, the proxy ballot, or the ballot that would be voted in a typical election in person. If it means the latter, that just, I think most of us say, well, that would be confusing if you both had to put in an absentee ballot plus the ballot that could be used at a meeting. Uh, but that's just another one of the confusions that exists. Uh, the ballot David, cannot... I'm, gonna, I'm sorry to interrupt for a second. One of the questions that just came in is, are your slides going to be under the handout tab? And the answer is, is yes. Um, yeah. They're going to be able to see all of these. And also, there was a question whether or not this entire seminar was being uh, taped so that it could be seen again. And the answer to that is yes. But we are um, getting tight on time. So if, if we could move forward with maybe the appeal part of it and where we stand with that. All right. Uh, I... This is the last slide before we get into the appeal. Okay, so, good. Uh, you have to have, you can't have a, a ballot indicate somebody is an incumbent. I don't think we dispute that, but that's not in the law. Each candidate's name has to be in the same font, size, and color. Again, don't dispute that, but it's not in the law. Here's the next one. Blank write-in lines equal to the number of positions up for election on the ballot. This again creates all sorts of issues. So if a person was never nominated, but somebody wrote their name down, we don't even know if they want to serve. They're not even present at the annual meeting. What do we do with those uh, write-in ballots? Uh, nobody talks about that in the regulations. Um, okay, uh, and the ballot depository, I'll just skip to the last one, must be secured. Again, they don't say what that really means. I think in most high-rise and mid-rise buildings, we mean there should be a ballot box, a locked ballot box out where people can simply put it in the ballot box. That's fine. 
But if it's not in that situation, does that mean the manager has to put it in a lock, lock ballot box? I guess so. Um, but again, a DCA's language is rather loose. Okay, so now you know why we uh, got excited about this and why DCA, uh, I'm sorry, CAI New Jersey decided to go forward with a lawsuit. So um, the LAC uh, first carefully considered this, uh, whether this was something we could live with the way it was, we decided it wasn't. So we wanted to recommend to the CAI New Jersey chapter uh, that a lawsuit be pers pursued on this. Uh, the Greenbaum Row firm, who had experience in appealing regulations in not for CAI, but for other entities, was chosen as the lead counsel. Other attorneys on the LAC are also participating in that and contributing to that effort. So the suit uh, sought to overturn the totality of the regulations. And one of the reasons that is, is because, as I said very early on, there is no regulatory authority that was granted in this Radburn election bill. DCA relies on a provision from the 1970, whatever it was, eight law that introduced PREDFIDA, Planned Real Estate Development Full Disclosure Act, that was a developer-oriented act. It had nothing to do with associations other than associations that were under developer control. DCA was given authority in that instance. Since then, DCA has not been given authority in any of the amendments to the PRED Act, yet they insist they had this right. Now, after the suit was filed, the Attorney General's office filed a motion to dismiss. Of course, we objected to that and we filed reply papers. But the appellate division surprisingly granted that motion based on a failure to exhaust administrative remedies. The problem is there are no specific administrative remedies when you object to regulations. There are administrative remedies in other instances in front of the DCA. This is not one of them. Now, the opinion did dismiss it without prejudice, meaning that suit could be rebrought. That means we'd have to go to DCA. We would have to file a petition saying we object to these regulations. There is no uh, process in the DCA regulations for doing this. There's no number of days for DCA to respond. There's no indication if we're not happy with the DCA, whether we first would have to go to an administrative court, uh, administrative law judge, and then to the appellate division. It's very confusing. And in no regulatory appeal before did any court ever throw out a regulatory appeal on a failure to exhaust administrative remedies. In fact, there's case law directly on point to the contrary. So and da and David, didn't we uh, didn't we uh, try to approach the DCA and, and resolve this unofficially um, in the first place? Yeah, we did so on an informal basis on the hope that based upon relationships that members of the LAC had with the DCA uh, and specifically Chris Lee, who Chris does a lot of work with the DCA, uh, we tried to very gently approach them and say hey, we're willing to sit down with you and try to you know, uh, smooth off the rough surfaces here and get to a place where we can live with these regulations. And we received a letter from Sheila Oliver, uh, the commissioner of the DCA saying no. So that in fact is one of our arguments that we already tried, we were already rejected, and now the appellate division is saying, we'll go back and try again. So we decided and the chapter accepted. And by the way, I, I, I should have said earlier, the chapter board considered our, our recommendation to move forward with this. It unanimously endorsed the recommendation and authorized that the lawsuit be brought in the chapter's name. Now we're pursuing a two-prong response to the rejection by the appellate division. The first is seeking a certification to be able to appeal to the New Jersey Supreme Court. Now, for those who are not lawyers, when you are seeking to appeal to the Supreme Court, you do not have the right to appeal. It's not an automatic right of appeal. You have to first require or request uh, what is called certiorari or cert. 
and the Supreme Court has to say, yes, we consider this case to be one that we should consider. The argument to the New Jersey Supreme Court is if you accept this appellate division panel's determination, you have two different appellate division panels who have ruled 180 degrees to the contrary to each other, and the Supreme Court should be deciding in the public interest what is the remedy to a regulation? Do you have to go and exhaust any administrative remedies? The second thing we're doing simultaneously and in parallel is we're in the process of preparing a petition to see DCA seeking those administrative remedies. And many of the things that uh, I discussed earlier are the items that we're objecting to, in addition to which they never had the power to adopt these regulations to begin with. So that's where we are as of today. That uh, request for certiorari to the New Jersey Supreme Court uh, has been filed. Uh, a brief will be due, uh, I think, in about a week or two. Uh, of course, we expect the Attorney General to object uh, on behalf of the DCA. And then we will get a determination from the New Jersey Supreme Court whether it will hear an appeal on the issue of whether this should have been dismissed. Now, understand the Supreme Court could do one of several things. It could reject the request and say, not, you know, just deal with what you have to deal with. It could take the appeal and basically, after <laughs> many months of litigation, uh, it could say, appellate division, you were wrong. Go back to the appellate division. Forget about dealing with the uh, DCA on this issue. Or it could say, you didn't develop a sufficient enough record appellate division because you issued no opinion in this. So we're sending this back for further opinion, we're remanding it to the appellate division to basically make its arguments as to why this should have gone through this process. You know, there, there's an old saying that the uh, wheels of justice grind slowly, but finally, unfortunately, that's what we're in the midst of right now. And it's time consuming but we haven't given up. So by any means, we haven't given up. So George, I'll stop there and turn it back. Thanks so much, David. So I guess the bottom line is then that these regulations are still the law of the land and, and we all in, in the industry have to do our best, uh, even in impossible circumstances sometimes to comply with them. Uh, we would recommend that if any one of you, whether manager, lawyer, homeowner, leader, you are having difficulty understanding what your obligations are based on these regs, put, a, put it in writing to the DCA. Explain to them that we don't know how to do this. So please explain to us. Uh, many of us have done that. Uh, we haven't received any responses from the DCA, but there's no certainly no harm in letting them know that these regulations just are in many instances, difficult, if not impossible, to comply with. So, David, and I, thank you so much. I would just say don't hold your breath for a response. Uh, it's, it's probably not coming. Uh, right. So, yeah, it is the law. However, where this directly contradicts the Radburn Act, you have to get legal counsel to tell you which you should follow, the act or the regulations. That's between you and your attorney. Okay, so um, we've got uh, we've we've got Matt and Tom. Tom, uh, Tom and Matt, you've got about ten minutes each left to get us to two o'clock. So uh, Matt, go ahead and tell us about electric vehicle charging stations. You're muted. Thanks, George. There we go. All right, that's my PowerPoint. I'll be brief. Um, I don't need to belabor it. Um, so. Uh, we started working on this bill about um, two or three years ago. It was it, it was came through from our lobbyists that it, certainly a bill was going to be passed that would require associations to permit electric electric car charging stations to be installed in unit owner parking spaces. Um, and there was a model bill from Oregon and some other places that the car charging industry was was promoting in various states including New Jersey, and it was very harsh on um, condominiums. It really gave the board no discretion to deny an application. It had very minimum protections, um, you know, to associations and the boards, uh, you know, as far as, you know, indemnification and things that you might want to see if an owner was going to install a car charging station in his own parking space. So we negotiated it for quite a long time. 
And um, ultimately, we came up with a bill that we liked quite a bit and, and that we supported. Um, it's a uh, the broad outline is that you uh, common interest community can't prohibit or unreasonably restrict the installation of charging stations, charging stations and designated parking spaces. Um, you're required to allow an owner to install a, a car charging station in his own spot, even if he requires some type of access through common elements. And the boards also now have the right to e either license non-assigned parking spaces like common area parking spaces or um, to create even create new parking spaces for purposes of creating a car charging station and also the right to install community charging stations. Um, the bill has a number of protections for CICs, including that you can deny an application if it's a life safety risk, which was not in the original bill. Um, the charging station has to meet whatever requirements there are on land use, regulations, or ordinances. The owner has to indemnify the community association for any damage from the charging station. They're responsible for all damages that are, that are caused by the installation or removal or use of the charging station, and those can be collected as assessments. And they have to maintain at least $100,000 in liability insurance and perhaps a higher amount if that is what is required of owners who do not own car charging stations. Um, there's a procedure that it lays out that common interest communities should review applications for charging stations in the same way that they review other, um, you know, architectural modification, additional alteration, improvement applications. Um, there is a time limit of 60 days for the association to review, which can be extended by request for additional information. Um, you can impose reasonable architectural standards for the charging stations. And if you conclude that the charging station will put you over your limit of electrical capacity and cause brownouts or something like that, you could actually hold any applications in abeyance. And when you get to that point, if you do, you actually have the right to specially assess owners with charging stations to pay for common uh, property improvements to increase your electrical capacity. And the owner has to use a licensed professional to perform the charging station installation. The owner has to pay for all the electrical usage and the owner has to pay for any review fees that you incur, such as an engineering fee, electric, electrician fees if you had to do like a load study and legal fees. Um, and we took out all of the bad parts of the bill. Originally, it had a fine provision for common interest communities and it had a um, provision for fee shifting where if an owner didn't like your decision on something and sued you, you had to pay the legal fees. So um, the bill was originally passed last year and through both houses and it was vetoed by the governor for reasons that I'm not totally clear on. It was passed again this year and it just got signed the other day. So, you know, be aware of the bill. If someone comes to you and says, I have an assigned parking spot, whether it's it's rented or designated or licensed or deeded, and they want to install a charging station, you have to take that application and, and give it a thorough review. And you may be required to permit them to, at their own cost and expense, install that uh, car charging station there. I think more realistically, what you're seeing is community associations are installing community ones because they're very uh, expensive, quite frankly, to install one. Um, but um, it is what it is. It's out there. There's some other bills pending that sort of relate to it. And George, one thing I, I want to mention unrelated to this, actually two things. One is that, you know, for people on, it's not one of the topics, the Palisades bill was introduced in the Senate. And then today, just by Assemblyman Johnson introduced it. Um, so that's the statute of limitations bill. And the last thing is, Ed, uh, you had mentioned the Louisiana takeout um, immunity bill. But you didn't mention whether that only applies to food or daiquiris. So I think some clarification is, is necessary. So anyways, that, that's my presentation, George. <laughs> Thanks a lot, you. Matt. Um, make note of that, Ed. Um, so Matt, it, it's, it, it's fair to say that this was really a train, this bill, um, the uh, electric vehicle charging bill, was a train we weren't going to be able to stop. But I think it's a good example of how we were able to become involved in the process and and as David used the term earlier, uh, smoothed down some of the rough edges and, and made it not just um, so that it wasn't harmful to common interest communities, but it in fact uh, benefits us in many ways, right? Yeah, exactly right. I mean, the, the from day one, it was, we're going to have a bill one way or the other. You guys work it out with the car charging people. And we did. And we ultimately got what we wanted without totally destroying the intention of the bill, which is to require associations to permit people to install car charging stations. 
but I think there's enough in there that we should all feel reasonably comfortable with how it came out and it's not going to harm any association. Great. Thanks for your efforts on that. Okay, Tom, so we're going to circle all the way back around now. And uh, last but not least is Tom Martin. Uh, Tom, we've been talking about this for several months now that we were concerned as common interest communities uh, that some of these bills that we've been seeing would have prevented us from doing our normal collections of overdue assessments. And, and we as nonprofit corporations know that that's deadly for us. So, so um, fortunately, they, they don't appear to have moved, but give us an update on where we are. Uh, George, uh, thank you. Am I, I am I on? I should be on. We hear you. Good. Okay. I want to say uh, to people from who were out of state on a completely different presentation. Uh, I'm from New Jersey. I do not need this thing you call a microphone. Thank you. So I'll just fill the room and speak from there. Uh, thank you all, especially for the attendees. You are all really the lifeblood of this uh, organization. Uh, it's much appreciated, especially the community association, volunteer leaders, board members, uh, unit owners or homeowners or professionals, as the case may be. Uh, you all really make it happen and make it work. And uh, George, thank you again for the intro. Um, I am a partner at Price Mies uh, Shulman and Darminio, representing community associations and a longstanding member of CAI and uh, former chair of, uh, of the Legislative Action Committee. And as George had mentioned, um, you know, uh, look, you know, the world has changed in the last number of months, as we all know. Um, when the governor executed his uh, executive order, I think it was March 21, the uh, stay at home order, uh, which set a lot of restrictions. A lot of those have been lifted over the last several months. We know that. But one of the more important uh, bills that came down um, from Trenton um, is called the COVID-19 Financial Security for Consumers Act. It's a bill, it's not a law. We worked to get it uh, worked on and uh, amended. I think it was introduced in early April, April 9. By mid-May, uh, we had amendments in place to make it possible for associations to enforce their maintenance fee obligations. Now, a, a word about um, the concept we all sometimes refer to as debt collection. Uh, I do like, I don't like that word. And I do like to say that when I go into court or I have to explain this, we're not really collecting a, a debt here in the classic sense. We're enforcing the maintenance fee obligations of our master deeds and the bylaws, just like anything else, okay? Uh, we all know that we have homeowners, unit owners, a certain number, we set our budgets. And based on that budget, we set our maintenance fee obligations. Uh, when you have a certain number or are not paying for whatever reason, we have uh, the board as an obligation to seek to enforce those maintenance fee obligations. Again, just like any other obligation. Your master deed says you can't paint your door purple. Well, you know, same thing. You're just enforcing that, okay? Um, if from our perspective, as the lawyers for an association, we want to make sure that we are following the law and addressing the needs that uh, of our association that need to be accomplished through the master deed and, and the bylaws. So um, um, as this law was proposed, uh, it raised a number of different issues as it relates to associations. Can we, can we lean? Can we sue for a money judgment? Can we foreclose and dispossess? And if we get a money judgment, can we execute on that judgment? You know, take money out of their bank account or um, get a wage execution, which is really a court order to the employer of the uh, unit owner or homeowner to deduct a certain amount of money and send it to the association to pay down the debt over time. The proposed law essentially would have said no to all those things. Can't lean, can't sue, can't foreclose, can't execute on anything. Uh, for a, uh, during the time of the um, uh, open em emergency orders that are in place and for 120 days afterwards. Now, uh, it seemed that in reviewing the law and the legislative history, this was really geared for mm -hmm. what you might call uh, consumer debt collectors. Uh, you know, the people you see on TV, hey, I'm getting harassed by a credit card company or a bank or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Or uh, there was some concern about stimulus money from the federal level being soaked up by a, uh, 
you know, a debt collector in the classic sense, which I think is not us. Okay, we're not big banks. We're nonprofits. We don't collect debt in the normal sense. We're enforcing the rules that we have that apply to everyone. Okay, um, and technically, if we can't enforce our master deed and our bylaws, we can't pay our bills. And does that make does that mean that we're insolvent technically? So we didn't think it was fair or reasonable. So the Legislative Action Committee, working through our Government Affairs Bureau, working through our in that sense and lobbyists, worked to try to get reasonable changes to the law. Uh, that, in a sense, and and cutting it down to its most basic elements, uh, means that um, uh, community associations can enforce our uh, master deed and bylaws, we can seek our judgments, and we can, under most circumstances, seek to enforce those judgments. So can we send a demand letter? Yes, you can, okay? Uh, you should always check with your lawyer, by the way, on all of these things before embarking on these. Uh, there are a lot of nuances to the law on how these things actually work. And if you don't follow these nuances in the law, uh, you set yourself up for uh, potential uh, liability and this existed before that this law was even uh, considered so yes you can send your demand letter you can have your lawyer follow up with a demand letter you can lean um, you can file your lawsuit for a money judgment okay you can also um, in another arrow in your quiver of weapons is to start a foreclosure nevertheless there is a moratorium on actually dispossessing a person in a foreclosure, okay? So you can start your foreclosure process, but it's gonna be quite a bit of time before you actually get to anyone you know, out of, uh, of a unit. You can also engage in enforcement activity of a, of a money judgment. You have to do so uh, through jumping through certain hoops and being very careful with how you proceed, okay? Um, but you can proceed as long as it is what they call now uh, within the interests of justice, which is a very fluid concept to be decided by a judge. In case there's an objection, uh, they could say, well, is this really in the interest of justice as the case may be? Um, again, we're working with the legislature um, <clears throat> to take what was a very difficult law to work with, it essentially would have made it impossible to enforce any of your maintenance fee obligations. And now we can enforce our maintenance fee obligations, but with certain restrictions um, that I think we can navigate, okay? And those amendments are going through certain committee votes in the state legislature. Nothing's been passed yet in terms of a law, um, it, but those were addressed in the uh, mid-spring, mid-May or so. I understand, I think the legislature adjourned for a period of time, came back, and now there is uh, I understand this, you know, there's an election, of course, coming up. Uh, vote early, vote often for your preferred candidate, as the case may be. But it seems as though the legislature is addressing those things now. But I would call this a cautious, qualified, uh, fingers crossed win for us uh, in a constructive sense to be able to move forward with your enforcement while at the same time balancing the needs of, uh, let's face it, some unit owners or homeowners who may be in substantial uh, difficulty uh, in the last six or seven months because the world really has changed. Which leads me to a last point. You may, as a board, um, have seen or been approached by unit owners or homeowners about, uh, well, you know, would you um, give us some slack? Would you give us some forbearance? Um, you should check with your lawyers on that. Uh, that as long as you're making a considered decision on that, um, check with your lawyers because um, some will say uh, you really need to balance that with um, with with, with uh, the facts that you know on the ground and whether you're going to do that or whether you're going to say no, you owe whatever you owe as the case may be. Those are only decisions you can make in consult with your lawyer. The bottom line here, I think, is that we were able to navigate this, um, and I hope uh, uh, that uh, you all stay safe and stay well, and know that we, as the Legislative Action Committee, are fighting for you to try to make these things work for your associations. With that, George, thank you. I'll turn it over back to you as, as the uh, chair, and uh, thank you.
Thank you, Tom. By the way, do you have that bill number by any chance off the top yes. of your head there? Yes, it, it is a Senate bill, S-2330. There's a companion bill in the state assembly. State legislature actually has a pretty good website to check these things uh, online, and you can look it up online. Be careful, though, because there's a lot of legislative history and a lot involved in these. So if you're looking at the bill, it may have been changed in the meantime. There's brackets and underlines, so you really need to look at the details of that so you don't inadvertently pull up the wrong bill or wrong version of the bill and think it says something when it really doesn't. Michelle, any intel on uh, whether that bill or any of these other debt collection bills are moving anywhere? Yeah, there's a there's a handful of bills with the same title or similar title, so I was glad you mentioned the number. Uh, this one, um, it did already pass the Senate. It's over on the Assembly side. Uh, if you remember, um, what happened was is we got some of these protections um, on the Senate side, and then the consumer advocate groups were mm -hmm. looking for a much broader bill and didn't like these changes. So it, it's really stalled on the assembly side. Um, I think it remains to be seen how bad, I keep giving the same answer, but it is the same answer. I guess it remains to be seen how bad the winter is and whether or not they'll come back around to this. Okay, great. All right, gang. Um, we are over time and almost out of time. Uh, and I, I wanted to thank all of you who attended I want to thank everybody on the panel for the work that you put into pre to the preparation. It was terrific. Uh, Angela, is there anything that we need to announce uh, or say before we get cut off in a minute and a half? No, nope, uh, everything's done. Thank you. Okay, we will try to get answers out to the questions that were posed. And also, um, you can go on to the chapter website to see the video as well as to see um, any of the handouts that were here tonight. So um, be safe, be well, and thank you all for attending. And we'll see you probably soon with another one. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you George. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, George.